Oh, I love seeing everybody. It's so nice. Hello, everybody who's joining us. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming in for another night of Northshire Live. It is a treat to see you all. Um, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, I know many of you who are regulars know that I'm usually joined by my wonderful colleague, David Wood. Um, he is away this evening on a brief vacation, so I am flying solo this evening, but it is great to see all of you here. Um, a quick reminder for those of you who are regulars and new information for those of you who are new. Um, we are recording this event this evening for subsequent broadcast on our YouTube channel. If you don't want to be part of that recording, it is very easy to avoid it. All you need to do is stay muted and you will not be picked up by the camera. Um, if when we get to the audience question portion of the evening, you can type questions into the chat. Um, you can go ahead and do that actually at any point throughout the evening and we'll get to them when we get to the audience questions. If when we get to audience questions, you want to be on camera and be part of the video for posterity, you can uh, let me know in a direct message that you would like to be on camera and I would be happy when your turn comes to ask you to unmute and go ahead and let you ask the question on camera then. Um, that covers the logistics for the evening. Um, tonight, our guest author is going to be interviewed by Marcia de Sanctis, the author of 100 Places in France Every Woman Should Go. Marcia is a former television news producer and a great friend of the North Shire Bookstore. Um, and she is the recipient of five Lowell Thomas Awards for Excellence in Travel Journalism, including Travel Journalist of the Year, and a Solas Award for Best Travel Writing. And our guest author this evening, Carrie Arsenal, is the book review editor at Orion Magazine and a contributing editor at LitHub, which is actually one of my very favorite literary websites. So those of you who don't know LitHub should definitely spend some time there. Um, her writing has appeared in Freeman's, LitHub, Oprah.com, and at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, among other publications. And she's here with us tonight to celebrate the release of her new book, Milltown, um, which is both an Indie Next pick for September and a Northshire staff pick several times over. So it's really a thrill to have her here with us this evening. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Marcia DeSanctis and Carrie Arsenal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Rachel. much. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Northshire Bookstore. Um, I was thinking that this is a very New England night because uh, I'm from Massachusetts. I live in Connecticut. I'm in Rhode Island talking to Carrie um, for a bookstore that's in Vermont um, about her book from Maine, ab about Maine. So um, I think it's a very, very appropriate that we have all kinds of weather happening outside too. Uh, and so I'm just gonna ask you just quickly to do a little reading about New England, um, just to kind of set us up. Yeah. Um... Let me see. Um, this, I'll just tell you, is to set this reading up, the, this was my mother and I were going through a bunch of documents uh, that she was sorting through. And she was going through these old mill, paper mill newsletters. Anyway, that's the setup of this. Were you ever bothered by the pollution, I ask, sniffing the newsletter, then pushing it towards my mother's nose? It was the smell of money, she says, shoving it aside. Plus, we just had a lot of pride. Pride. I heard this word a lot when I was growing up. We were proud to be from Rumford or Mexico. We took pride in the mill, pride in the paper we made. We scrawled Pinto Pride on the pep rally posters to honor our mascot. Mill managers instilled pride in their workers. What did it mean, this pride? I learned from an early age to be conspicuous was to be coarse. You didn't speak too loudly or too much. You blended in. This sameness, it turns out, was partially the source of our pride. We were all in it together, no matter what the it was. We're a community, and like most communities, we're proud of what we did, even if it was something we didn't necessarily like. It was part of that same unspoken social rule that also felt claustrophobic, so it was difficult to differentiate the two. It was a subtle force, like airplane, airplane cabin pressure, massive, but invisible. In this togetherness, our loyalties to each other and to our town were fierce, even if the intimation to conform was benevolent. This absolute loyalty didn't stop at the edge of town. It extended to hopeless causes like the Boston Red Sox and the New England Patriots, who for decades disappointed us with their fruitless company. 
But we stuck with them because that's what we did, despite their unwillingness to lo love us back. This mix of sameness and loyalty and pride and stubbornness made us tight. As we created this shelter for ourselves, it also meant outsiders remained outside. People from away weren't allowed into the sanctity of our tribe, and we certainly didn't want to be part of theirs. Solidarity was a matter of safety and comfort, but it was also a matter of hard-headedness that didn't always serve us well. The mill, the main source of the pride and connectedness, provided us with what seemed like limitless opportunity, the tentacles of its fortune reaching into the county, the region, the state of Maine, America. Our reliance on the mill and our pride was like our Catholicism. We were, giving some, we were given something to believe in while ignoring our own suffering all the while waiting for the big afterlife party in the sky. We depended on the mill, as did lumberjacks, whose lopping off of the trees was seemingly anathema to the very thing relied upon to earn an income. Trees grew back, that much we knew, but our resurrection, it would have to wait. It's so nice to hear you read that because I read the book, by the way, it's a wonderful book. The language is so powerful, the story is so, powerful and honestly it's hard to pick an excerpt to read because you could just kind of open to any page and you'll just have unbelievable strength of, of voice. Um, so and I should say that when you said from Mexico you mean Mexico Maine. Right <laughs> Mexico Maine I should clarify that for everybody yes. About that. But, so tell me how you so this is a it's a memoir and it's kind of an environmental detective story. Can you tell me how you decided to tell this story and kind of braid your very personal story together with this kind of huge environmental story that uh, is, by the way, very, very interesting the way you tell it? Um, I started the story, really started researching my family tree, uh, genealogy, and what happened, and like a, tra like a family tree, what happens is things start branching off into other avenues that you don't expect. You know, I don't know if anybody here has done genealogy, but even if you've done a little bit of it, you know how, you know, one thing, you find one thing and you keep going and it, it goes down these unforeseen paths. And as I started doing the genealogy, I also came up against environmental um, issues in the town as well as the high rates of cancer in our town. And those, those, those things were parallel tracking this sort of genealogy story. So, but they were also having their own sort of webs of, 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 of just avenues that I could go down. So uh, in, in trying to sort of harness all of that into a manner that could be read, I, I was trying to find a structure that would be germane to that, uh, to met to that story and to, but, but also, you know, keep it, Keep, just keep it relevant to the story I was trying to tell. So I used the structure of a river, um, which is the, the main river that our town was on, the Androscoggin River, which is a big, Andy McIsaac, I see you there, who grew up with me. Hi, Andy. Um, <laughs> um, so I based it on a river because I think a river, um, it does those things, it, it, like a family tree, it it's, goes out and also does funny things as it goes down yeah. river and but it goes forward nonetheless you know like a story should i mean i couldn't just write a story that just kept branching out because where would it go it would go nowhere um so it just had to keep moving forward and and it's interesting because i think the whole i thought about this after writing the book i think the book is in and of itself is about researching for writing the book it's 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 you watching me investigate right um my family tree and the environmental problems in our town. And I'm writing about it in fir first person and in present tense. And so right. you're with me along that. I thought that would be the easiest way too, to, to have people sort of be next to me and discovering as I discover things. Right, but like also like a river, it comes up against rocks and tree branches and goes a little this way and then starts pouring this way and stops there. So you, you had so many twists and turns in this story. But tell us a little bit about the environmental story and about you know, this, 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 uh, this mill town that has kind of a big, a, a big heavy legacy with it. Yeah, 
Um, I'm glad you brought up that word legacy because the legacies, yeah, they weren't just my family. It was the environmental legacies of this town. Um, so it's a paper mill town for those who don't know. And um, we, it's been open since 1901. Three generations of my family worked in this mill, including my grand, both sides of my family, grandparents, great grandparents for both sides. Um, and what the mill, when you bleach paper, there's, um, they use uh, chlorine products that in bleaching the paper, they create one of the most dangerous byproducts known to humankind called dioxins. And I decided to also follow the path of dioxins, which was as complicated as a family tree, um, really. And so all of these paths were mimicking each other. Um, so I tried to, dioxins were a really big issue in the 80s and 90s and sort of, um, but it sort of went away. And I found this in my research. It was like all this stuff I kept finding and then suddenly it just went away. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense for a very dangerous family of chemicals. It was the same, you know, the same chemical that was made to use Agent Orange. Um, anyway, so these dioxins were found early on in the downriver from our paper mill, one of the highest concentrations in the United States. And they found it in the fish um, is what they did, the EPA. and um yeah so that that would that that's the story i tried to follow um right and you you said that the the memory of drink uh, of drinking water there has stayed with you your whole life like you can actually have a difficult time drinking a glass of water i do i still you know it's really it's i, I should say this too it's a it's an investigative sort of memoir, but I'm not sure I ever found the answers. But I did ask a lot of questions, and um, one of those questions was: Is the pollution of our mill connected to the disease, or to you know, or to me not wanting to drink water? Was the water really polluted? You know, I mean, certainly the smell in our town was terrible. It smelled like farts and. Um, you know, even earlier, you know, in the 1940s, it was so bad that, you know, people, even in the 40s, which before environmental activism even took place, people were complaining. It was, you know, everything was blackened with soot. And Andy knows that our river was, when we were kids, it was rainbow colored. It was polluted. It was disgusting. You can't, you Did know. Did it smell? Was it, there like, was there a bad smell in the air? There was always a bad smell. I think there still is a bad smell. It's really hard to describe. It's this combination of sulfur and like res wood resin combined with just like chemicals. And now, you know, now it's not just legacy pollutants, but now they, they the mill burns tires for, for fuel um, as, a, as a new fuel source. And it's legal, but it, it's complicated. It's something I also explore in the book to a point, but it's so... What, what I came up against was a lot of a lot of things that were not just buried in our land and our soil, but were buried in you know files, you know, mm -hmm. millions of feet deep, and including you know some really important reports that have just been shelved and you know at the EPA um, and other places. So. Mm -hmm. So not just buried in your land and your soil and the EPA, but buried in almost every person that's from there too, right? Some and every person on this phone call, actually, mm -hmm. because dioxins are, dioxins are, the reason why they're so terrible is they're bioaccumulative. And what that means is they, they go, once they are in your body, they, once they go up the food chain and the top of the food chain is, is the human body and it concentrates as it goes up the food chain. So if, you know, it's mostly found in the fatty tissue of things we eat like beef and, you know, eggs and byproducts like butter, fish, whatever, anything, lobsters. Um, so we eat those and it goes up and it gets a higher dosage. Like there's, uh, I think it's 70, breastfeeding mothers is the worst because their, their breast milk is such a high concentration of fat that, they're giving dioxin loads to their babies 77% higher than the EPA recommends. So it's not just legacy and it's not just the past as um, the, Rumford, the Rumford Economic Advisor recently said in the main Sunday paper a couple weeks ago when they wrote a profile about me. 
who's like, oh, her book's about the past. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Legacies are related to our current moment and our current bodies, everybody. So dioxins are in our bodies, basically what I've been told, everybody on this call to a point of, you know, we're at our maximum body burden right now. Right, right. Um, for these kind um, of toxins. And that's just one toxin. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said this wonderful thing, uh, the idea that our past is connected to our future is not magical thinking. It was a great thing that you said. It was, it was kind of related to something else, but, yeah. but I, I love the way that you said the past is, ev is, is everything. It's, it's where the DNA comes from, but it, but it is also something we carry. You know, yeah, just like our, fam our families, I mean, it, whether it means our family DNA or the toxic DNA, you know, right. that we're all carrying. Yeah. And I also oh, found it fascinating. It was like, there was just not that, like I said, it wasn't that one chemical. It's just one. There's mercury, right. and all sorts of other. I'm, I'm so much fun to hang out with. No, you are. You are actually. You <laughs> I'm like, really fun to hang out with. You're I see new. people hanging up now. <laughs> you have cool stuff all around your house. Um, but there's another. I mean, just as dioxin is kind of a, a thread that is woven through the whole narrative, so is this, and, and this is why I was talking about braiding your stories together, even though braiding would think yeah. that was three different threads, but um, the story of your French, French Canadian ancestors. So I, I think you call them Arcadians, but they're Acadian, they're the Acadian. both, because both word is, both words are correct, apparently, but you call it, they're Acadians. Well, the Arcadian was, the, this is just, it was just a word that people thought that's where it came from, Arcadian, but it's right, Acadian, right. A-C-A. Arcadian. Yeah. yeah, Acadian. So tell us a little bit about the Acadians. I mean, we know that that's a word that's associated with Maine because of the National Park, but what are they exactly? Oh, that's so funny. You know, I never even occurred to me. <laughs> okay. Acadian National Park. I don't oh, even know if that's connected. Yes, I think it's the only national park in New England, right? I mean, that just the name of it, it never occurred to me that... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah, interesting. Donna was saying something interesting. I'm not sure she wanted to say something. Donna, did you have something you wanted to say? Do you know something I don't know? No. Anyway, um, so my Acadian ancestors, yes, though part of the, the investigation was... I. This was another story. So this this story of pollution in our town was a was a story that really hadn't been told and not just in our town but I think in a lot of mill towns in New England I really haven't read that story in a in a narrative form you know or read about people like I grew up with like working class people just in a non-fiction narrative form so and, and I think part of the and I'm getting to the Acadian question because it's related but yeah. I think part of the reason I I wanted to tell these stories is these, these were like, these are stories that are not spectacular, you know, they're not, it's not Chernobyl, it's not like a big environmental event, it's nothing that's happening that's, you know, newsworthy, frankly, it's really hard to, to you know, I've even been trying to pitch, you know, op-eds, and people are just like, nah, it's not newsworthy enough, you know, but, but, and, and it's a smaller story, but it's, it's an important story and it's affecting us all. Like I said, it's affecting all our bodies. Um, and the Acadian story is, is very similar, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a smallish story compared to other diasporas or, I mean, if you look at the, the UN definition of ethnic cleansing, that's what happened to the Acadians. You know, my, so the Acadians up in the maritime provinces in, in Canada were basically, you know, um, cleansed by the British in 1755. Um, you know, their house is burned and the family split up and um, all, both sides of my family come from that area, as well as Quebec, which is a different group, Quebecois or French Canadian, some people like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a population that got uh, dispersed. And, and, and even though people still call themselves Acadians, there's not even Acadia to go back to. So that also configured into my examination of home. You know, here's people that consider Acadia their home, but it's not even on a map anymore. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking of that too while I was writing my book about my sort of reckoning. And, you know, the subtitle of my book is Reckoning with What Remains. And I think Acadians do that a lot too. And somewhere that I, I personally didn't you know, when we were growing up, uh, we didn't really learn anything about Acadian history. So it was me learning about my 
past that I knew nothing about. We didn't get taught anything. It was really surprising for a town that had like a lot of Acadians, right. a lot of French Canadians. Right. The phone book right. was Arsenal, you know. <laughs> the Arsenal dynasty. Yeah. Um, but it's, but you do talk about how they, you know, these just, these are hardy, salty, earthy, incredibly hardworking people, genetically so. And they moved to Maine from Canada to be, to build up the American working class. And it's sort of like, and look what happened to them. It's really, it's, it's interesting. Like it's, yeah, you mean oh, moving from? Are you saying moving from Canada to Maine? Yeah, to do to to the all the yeah, and yeah, really, and really formed part Island. of the big working class yeah. industrial manufacturing backbone of America, which isn't an actual backbone. It's more of a scaffolding like a, or a something. broken bone, <laughs> yeah. I mean, or a scaffolding, or something yeah. that every you know they oh oh I see that the economy was kind of built on, but it didn't really reward them for their hard work. Yeah, and again, it goes back to that sort of unspectacular story that, you know, uh, when we're reading about, a, you know, I've read so, you know, I'm a book critic too, so I read a lot of books and I haven't read that sort of story about that. That's what I'm saying about those people and what happened, what happened to the working class of America. And this book sort of, not only does it follow the, the, the sort of the, my family and this stuff, environmental stuff, but it follows the rise and fall of the working class because I follow my family all the way down to Maine. You know, I actually go back to even France at one point, go to Canada um, and then go to Maine. And then, you know, here I am. Um, so I follow the arc of the working class a little bit too. And, and I think that some people will be surprised to- Right. Right. You see. So, but so what was it like for you? So you, well, first of all, what does it mean to you to be, to identify, I guess you identify as someone who is working class or, or you are from the working class. Can you, can you explain that a little for, um, you know, kind of generally, it should yeah. be obvious, it should be obvious, right? I mean, you had this great thing that your, your father said about a blue collar workers like your father who, respect another man's rights and another man's job. But I mean, maybe blue collar is, is working class and. Yeah, it's complicated. I, and it's something I'm not sure I even have figured out. I'm working on something yeah. to say about this, but I, what I can say is this, I definitely identify with working class as a, like I look at middle class as an income level, whereas working class feels more like a, a way of being brought up. Like Ben Ben Fountain, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ben Fountain, but his he wrote this incredible thing, and I say it all the time now. He said somebody from the working class is you take a shower after work instead of before it. <laughs> um, That's perfect. It's perfect, really. Yeah. And, and yeah. even though I don't like shower at all sometimes, no, just kidding. Um, I understand that that mentality speaks yeah. to me. I mean, even now, you know, I'm. I can't consider my working class. I mean, I don't even have a job, really. I'm a writer. I don't know if that's, that's a job. I mean, I work all the time, but I don't make any money. Um, but it's a mentality I was brought up with, with, you know, work hard, you know, pay your dues. Even though every time I try to do that, it sort of generally fails sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> the hard work doesn't necessarily always pay off. Well, but it's, yeah. I mean, it is. You sit in the I'm hard work. It's more of a hustle than... Hustle, yeah. in the more punching in in the morning and punching out at night and that kind of it's a rigor yeah the rigor and the you know no no complaint you know like i was just saying to rachel and marcia like i'm running on a generator right now <laughs> we just lost three giant trees in our yard we just had this tornado yeah three 300 year old trees just came boom down my it was an, actually a tornado you had there? I don't know what it was, but I was in the basement a half hour before this with my cats, you know? So anyway, part of that is just kind of the, that's the mentality of, I mean, I think all of you can agree, New England people, that is, that's part of it too, is growing up in New England, you just figure stuff out. You just get it done, you know? Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of, um, I mean, I know Marsha's like that. <laughs> you just- Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, I, every time I go by your house, you're kind of in Wellington boots and carry, you know, like with a tool belt around your, your waist practically like that. So that's a, that's actually, um, you know, that's a, that's a great quality to have when you live in the country because you, you still live in New England, although a very different part of New England with a very different personality. Totally different. And, and in a way, I mean, you've gone very far from Mexico, Maine. You, you've lived all over the world. You've, um, you know, you got a master's in uh, an MFA in, in creative writing. You've written a book. You have a writing career. So what was it like to kind of go home again, to go home and kind of immerse yourself in in your DNA, basically, and like your your literal and your kind of figurative DNA. What was that like for you? Yeah, this was a book I did not want to write. Um, I just thought, oh God, I have to go home and spend all this time <laughs> there. And it was, I was apoplectic about it, honestly. And But there were so many people encouraging me to write this story that they also hadn't heard about. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, I was kind of obsessed with it at the same time, so I couldn't avoid it. But um, going home at first was, you know, I hated it. And I hated it for a long, for a long time. I mean, I spent 10, 10 or so years, more, probably more on this project, 10 years writing it. But, um, but the more I went home and tried to really see what the community was about, the more I began to really appreciate it. You know, I mean, we all go through that. I think if you leave home when you're a young person, you're like, oh, that stupid old town. You know, everybody goes through that version of it, whatever it is. I did that. A small town, yeah. Yeah, or small town, anything. It was just kind yeah. of like, eh, I don't need you. You know, I did that. And then it was like, yeah. and then I really moved away. And it yeah. wasn't, yeah. I thought, oh God, I'm never going back there. And then I had to write a book about it. So it was terrible. And then, um, like I said, the, the more I realized it wasn't necessarily the town, it was the people that like, I really felt a deep affection for. And that doesn't matter what the environment around them is, you know, even though the town is still, I mean, the environment and the landscape is still problematic. The people are great. They really are. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah. have so much fun. They just, you know, I go home and like, Carrie, everybody's been so supportive of this yeah. book. You know, I'm sort of bashing on the town a little bit. <laughs> not bashing, but it just, yeah. it's not. Or just telling some really uncomfortable truths. Uncomfortable truths. Thank you, bashing. Is yeah, but, are, but to people, and it was it a kind of thing where everybody, everybody knew somebody that got sick. Everybody knew somebody that had cancer. Everybody everybody knew someone. It wasn't just a, a coincidence. I mean, most people know someone or several people in their life that have gotten sick with, with cancer or maybe respiratory diseases, but it's just the coincidence is, it, it's just far too repetitive up there. And did yeah. people kind of not want to talk about it because it was biting the hand that feeds them? Or did they, I mean, you, I, you obviously find some amazing characters in, you know, right in your own hometown. But did, were people kind of reluctant to open up to you? Were they saying like, who are you to come? You know, now you're this big fancy, you know, this yeah. big fancy woman that lived in Sweden or something. Um, was there a little of that? Or were, were people, did you find that people were pretty willing to talk about it? I, I found people were pretty willing to talk to me and because I, I'm really the same person. I mean, despite where I have gone and what I have learned and I feel like I'm the same person. I think most of my friends would... You know, it doesn't matter what our politics are. It doesn't matter where we've been. I, I felt very welcomed and, you know, I mean, not I'm not going to say everybody in the world likes me there. So, you know, there's that. But I don't think there was any sort of animosity or or people weren't talking to me because because of who I was now. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I forgot. Yeah. So I was asking you about, about whether people oh. were worrying about, I mean, there's, Oh yeah, Maybe they were saying, "Oh my God, I have to deal with that arsenal girl again today." But but well, people say that anyway. Because, people, it you know. seems like people, you got there wasn't really anybody oh. who said, "I you know I I will not talk about this with you." Right, that's what I was going to say. So the cancer too, and you said you know um, Terry Martin, who was in town, 
she was a nurse in town and her husband was a town doctor. She did a, she did it at her actual own little study and she went house to house and did like a survey of, of down by my, where my grandparents lived to see how many people had cancer. You know, she did this informal thing and she found, you know, it was kind of, it was a bit insane. Like you said, it was not just each house, but like generations of each house, you know, generations of families. And, um, and it actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a project I'm just starting now. And if there's anybody here from Mexico, Maine, besides Andy, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to start a project where, and I've got a bunch of people on board so far. I want to, um, I want to take, I want to do a cancer yearbook and I want to take pictures of everybody in our town that has lived there or lives there now. And I want to record their diagnosis and do a yearbook. <laughs> and I think it would be really powerful. I think it would be a, a a massive amount of people and it's not the kind of evidence anybody can ignore anymore right you know? and in a way didn't you kind of frame this book around your your own father's diagnosis you know i didn't um no. i i did not it was his diagnosis came in the middle of writing this book right. um, as did a few other people while writing this book so if you I think maybe four people died that I was that are in this book that while I was writing it, including my father, um, who got cancer in 2013 and died in 2014. And I started this book in 2009. So, yeah, he his his death actually comes in the center. So instead of being the impetus, it was the center of the book, which makes more sense structurally. It just happens to work out. He's like the center, right? You know, um, and it it didn't necessarily changed the way I was thinking, but it, it, it gave me more sort of uh, more impetus to, to figure yeah. out what, what, what does his death mean? You know, what did it mean anything? Like, uh, what, what can it mean? Or, yeah. yeah, but also you're doing, it, it's one of those, I don't even want to say, it's sort of like a tra tragic happenstance that can happen to a writer that you were doing this story, kind of discovering your own identity and kind of the meaning of this mill and this, and this, the, the, and, and the, the paper mill, the paper factory and, and the cost that it, and, and the cost of the town. And then the cost becomes a very personal one as well. So it's, I mean, in a strange way, it, it, almost happened had to happen that way that like right. yeah. where it was so deeply personal and just your your really personal lovely um expression of that that and by the way now i'm losing my own father from this yeah i mean that's really just that's exactly right it almost it was like a foregone conclusion right i mean and you feel very certain without the government calling dioxin a you know a carcinogen that his that his um his cancer was related to to the mill yeah he um he had asbestosis he was a pipe fitter in the mill so he had was exposed to asbestos and asbestos can easily and usually evolves if you live long enough into lung or esophageal cancer and his did and that's what eventually killed him so there's really no doubt, and that's not dioxins, but dioxins do, there are studies that connected dioxins to heart disease, and he had heart disease. A lot of people actually there have heart disease, and there's a lot of, um, by the way, I should tell everybody, the mill is still open. I don't, I don't know if I made that clear, but the mill is still open operating. And the mill is such a, is, is, a, is such a centerpiece. To tell this great story about the mill that, you know, it got its real shot in the arm because of National Geographic. Yeah, ironically, right? <laughs> that's that's her, yeah. It was in the 50s, I think. Yeah, National Ge You know, photography suddenly came, became this new medium of to, way to tell stories. Yeah, print photography. Print photography, right. Yeah. And they wanted white, 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 white paper, you know. And so the whiter the paper, the more the chemicals, really. It was like, so we started, we, they put in this new machine that made, you know, they had a contract, a big contract with National Geographic for 15 years, I think it was, and made all the paper for them, but they also made it for dozens of other magazines, um, even including my own publisher, they, Macmillan, um, they made paper for them, book paper, um, magazine, glossy magazine paper. 
they were providing a lot of paper to a lot of things we've all touched. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. should say that I want to say this before I forget, but my book is not used, but with, is not made using that kind of paper. Yay. Yay. Um, yeah, that's, that is really an incredible story. Um, and because, and I don't know why we would have to think of that particular magazine with sort of, I mean, storytelling purity or something like that. I mean, it's, I've it's, tried to get in touch with them too, to see how they're making their paper, but nobody ever responds. I'm just going to keep emailing them like once a year, you know, to see if somebody responds or maybe someday I'll write something. Do you know anybody? Have you written? Maybe not really, but at least people tend to save their National Geographic. So it's it true. For it's true. nothing. People have them, you know, stacked up in their basements. Yeah. But still, the Jackson was already created, right? Yeah, yeah, it was already, it's all in our bodies. And probably because the paper was such a good quality that it's, it's, it's enduring after all these decades. Right. What do you think? So this book also turns on its ear a little bit, the sort of lobsters and lighthouses and blueberries um, <laughs> Maine reputation. So do you think there is a misconception about Maine? And, and if so, what do you think is the, the biggest misconception? Or is that just a, a, an unfair way to say that not everything is lighthouses and blueberries? I mean, that's a complicated thing. I mean, I mean, I do take to task, not just the main myths, but a lot of myths like um, in our town, even, uh, you know, Paul Bunyan, you know, we have this giant, we have one of those giant Paul Bunyans in our town, you know, it's huge. And, and um, this is just an example, but, you know, we, we celebrate him. We had, they had like a lumberjack festival and all this stuff. And we, we celebrate that, that myth, right? But he was like the guy that deforested the woodlands <laughs> and, you know, chopped, you know, clear cut everything. Yet there's like another person from our town, which who's Ed Muskie, who, penned the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, and we don't have like a musky celebration. I don't, I don't right, know why. Right. So there's just those, those kind of myths that are, are just, you know, need to be sort of cracked open and contextualized, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and looked at a little more carefully. And I think Maine has been more guilty of that than anything, you know, and it's not to say that Maine isn't beautiful because anybody who's been there, it is. And even my town's beautiful, the rivers and the valleys and the mountains and the skiing, mm -hmm. it's great all of that. Um, but you just have to like peek behind the curtain a little bit to like understand that. And I, I think, I think all the tourist dollars that come pouring in and, you know, people say, you know, most of it happens on the coast, as you know, you mm -hmm. know, um, there's that as well as it, those monies don't necessarily reach people like in Mexico, Maine, you know, it's not really helping them. It's a place of high taxes and disease. It's not, it's not a, primeval forest at all mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think I think some of those myths have hurt Maine really and and have stopped people because if people don't see them then it's again it's ignored and then they're not seeing what's really there and how can people help it right. how can people even tourists who come in you know like I hope this opens a few eyes to say huh what else is going on there mm -hmm. It's a very big state too. It's a big, and it's 90% forested still, even yeah. despite Paul Bunyan. Which is amazing. Yeah. And his, and his ax. And his big ax. I think it is sort of a celebration of brawn, that book, more than, you know, more than anything else. It's like this guy is so powerful. It's sort of another maybe American myth or something, but it is a little mysterious. It's a very unique state. And yeah, and in the, the vacation land, you know, everybody calls yeah. it vacation land. And it's funny, and I, I think I say something like, you know, vacation was someplace we went, you know, wasn't, right. for us vacation land was not, I mean, we didn't go far, we didn't have a lot of money, and there were five right. kids in our family, and we went to our camp. And when I say, you know, it was funny, because I've traveled all these places, I should say my husband was in the Coast Guard, that's why I traveled all these places, he was in the military for 20 something years. He's going to kill me again. He's downstairs. I keep forgetting how many years he was in. But he gets a pass. Yeah. He was in for a long time. And um, uh, 
uh, what was I saying? So you were saying um, vacation. Uh, vacation land, yeah. yeah. So and you were living in the place where other people went, yeah. Yeah, people would always ask me, you know, oh, camp. You know, they'd have this idea about camp. They said, oh, I went to camp in Maine. I was like, our camp wasn't that kind of camp. Like they thought I owned a camp. You know, our family yeah. owned a camp and ran a camp. I was like, no, a camp is like a structure my grandfather built. You know that. You know, I think a lot of people on this phone call understand what a camp is, but. Most people across the world don't know that. We think it's yeah. we think we owned and ran like a girls camp where we like beaded things. I don't know. Um, so it was some of this book was in response to those questions too, all across the world. And people, where are you from? Maine, you know, and I'd explain where I was from and oh, I love that. It's so beautiful there. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it was it was kind of that conflict that of like, oh, it's a crappy place. No, it's a great place. You know, it, that conflict is played out in the book really sure. in my relationship to home to try to explain what it is really. Right. How did it get to be called Mexico? Um, there's no real clear answer on that, but there's, yeah, there's a China, a Denmark, a Sweden, uh, you know, all those wow. places. Yeah, Peru, wow. Lisbon. Wow. Yeah, Moscow. I'm seeing, I'm seeing Donna's mouth moving. I can see. You know, Paris, <laughs> I mean, I all that French influence. Would you say that, what would you say was your, Biggest surprise writing the book? Hmm. I mean, either as either writing it right. or in the investigation of this story. Did you have um, that I became an, I think the biggest surprise was I became some accidental activist. Mm -hmm. with it. Um, there's a chapter in there where Nestle. Um, comes to Rumford and wants to purchase the water supply rights in our town. And I suddenly become, I'm writing this book and I suddenly become involved <laughs> in the town firsthand about trying to like not get Nestle in our town. So that was kind of, and I thought, is this journalistically sound? And then I was like, I don't really care. It's what needs to get done. You know, it wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't on an investigative journalistic thing. And furthermore, I don't know how any journalist could be objective for any kind of project like this. Mm -hmm. like you got to have something invested into it or why write about it. Right. So what did happen with Nestle? Was that Poland Spring? Pol yeah, Nestle owns Poland Spring, which is the bottled water company that was founded in Maine. Um, so they wanted to buy up the water rights for the springs outside in, in the Rumford Water District, and they did. Um, so my, in effect, I had no effect on that. But I did write this book and I did talk about them in it. Yeah. <laughs> about their method. Is the water clean? Is the drinking water in the bottles clean? I have no idea. And I, I don't know. <laughs> Is it a spring? I mean, that's actually the real question. There's a lawsuit right now against Nestle, a class action suit um, claiming, you know, that this is not spring water because, you know, if you go to that, if you go to that property where they are taking water from, it's questionable because it's not, it's not, what's the word, um, expressing itself naturally upon the land. Um, they have to like dig way down and go over here and go over there and then it's a spring. I don't know. It's, it's complicated. I don't want to get into any legal stuff about it, but, right, right. No, I, I, but a lawyer, the lawyer on that lawsuit did help me look at my chapter. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah. So there's a big lawsuit currently pending and Rumford just became part of that lawsuit thanks to me that's amazing well not just thanks to me but i gave them a lot of information yeah so did you find out i mean were you satisfied with the re with what you with what you uncovered were you did you say like i've, I've got it like this is as far as i can go or you do you feel like you're done with this story <laughs> no 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 i mean as like I was saying about that project I want to do with this cancer yearbook, there's the tire burning situation, which had me totally befuddled. Wow, there's that's incredible. The, the EPA report that comes at the end that's not been published. I don't want to, you know, ruin the book for y'all, but mm -hmm. there's a book, there's an EPA report that has not been published that I think should be published. Um, so there's a lot of, and there's just small, you know, I never did find my Great grandmother, <laughs> you know, there's family questions too, genealogical questions, and and you know, I wish my father had had an autopsy, you know, but he didn't, and you know, is 
and it's ongoing with the people that keep emailing me and asking me questions and telling me about their stories about living there or I'm probably there's probably some in this chat right now I think I just saw somebody yeah look I lived in Reedfield Maine for 30 years raised my kids there taught school in Wayne let's see um this is Donna she says I remarried wow. to Vermont her um Several new friends who lived grew up in Maine, including one who is from Rumford. Her husband taught French in high school there and died from cancer 10 years ago. I can connect her with you for your project. Yes, please. I will put, I'm gonna put my email up here right now, right Good. before anybody like leaves me. This is a lovely exchange. Oops, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just gonna wrap it up and please don't forget yeah. to click, uh, click to buy because uh, it's really, really a terrific book. There's a lovely exchange in the chat. Um, Andy says, the mill gives and it takes. My father worked there and his salary raised 10 kids. I have a brother with cancer and a great friend from high school who's fighting it. And then Ellen chimed in um, that she grew up in a small mill town in upstate New York and the mills gave lots of donations and grants and jobs and they took sickness, air quality, poisoned water. And I wondered, Carrie, sort of where you fall on that spectrum of the mill giving and taking and, and how you sort of came, come away from this writing process feeling about it. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's one I cannot possibly answer because <laughs> if you wanna say like, okay, the mill gave me my college education and like everything, well, it didn't. I mean, my husband gave me everything basically. Um, but I mean, now currently, but like my father and parents gave me education, right? And they. They wanted me to succeed beyond the borders of my town. But like, was it worth my father dying for? Like, how can I answer, how can I possibly answer that? Um, I also think that I would like to start to try to look at things in, you know, non-binary things. Like it, it, is the, it is the conundrum of the book. I put it out there. I'm like, you know, people were dying for the same thing that they were living for. And I put that conundrum out there. But I just, I just wonder um, if we can, I don't know, is there some way that, I mean, it would, it would help to start making books out of paper that's bleached responsibly, you know, or, you know, I don't, I don't have many solutions, but I just, I just want people to start looking at it and, and like thinking about their leaders and the people who are making these laws, you know, why, why is there a certain limit of, why, why is there, why are they allowing us any fish to eat from that river? Why are there body burdens that we are allowed to carry? Why shouldn't they be zero? You know, what, let's, let's vote for the leaders who are gonna like keep us alive. Like they don't really, they aren't really looking, you know, why are they testing the fish and not the humans? You know, we need to really do what I want to come, vote for people who are gonna like keep us alive. And that doesn't matter what political party you're from. It's just like, if you want your family to live, <laughs> it's just like no question. And I'm not saying ban the mill. I think the mill is doing, you know, I'm writing a book. I'm in publishing. I have books everywhere. Marsha knows. They're all through my house. Yeah, we, yeah. All use, we use paper by the bajillions, but let's we just figure, figure out a way to do it. It's not gonna Especially cost. now we're, we're all using, you know, wipes and paper bags. We're back to paper bags now. So you can't, it's either paper bags or plastic. Yeah. It's yeah. And it's not just paper. I should say it's like, it's, you know, diapers and tampons and it yeah. goes on and on stickers and yeah so somebody uh jean just wrote a, from romford joined said, my mom raised five of us two of us had cancer so that's just that is a 40 percent odd of having cancer in in one family is that jean lapointe it just says Jean from Rumford, but it might be Jean LaPointe, who I who actually noted as one of the- I shouldn't say that if she didn't give her name. I don't know. <laughs> one of the terrific characters. Um, yes, it is. It is Jean LaPointe. But is that, is there this, is there a pall over the place? Because your book is actually, I can't say light, but it's funny and, and dark funny. And, <laughs> you know, it's not, this isn't, a, you know, a dirge. This is a, this is- yeah you know, very lively writing, but, but, but this is extremely sad. And if everybody, but well, why do people live there if they think they're gonna get cancer? Like- They can't they, leave. They can't leave and they just accept this as maybe the, the odds that something- Well, you can't, I mean, if you, you know, take my mother for instance, well, not now, but like, you know, you wanna leave, who are you gonna sell your house? Who are you gonna sell your house to? and who wants to buy a house near that in that town and, and when there's no jobs and you know there's 
the legacy of pollution and you know who and then where's she going to move how much money is she going to get and how's she going to leave you know that's just one example or if you you know if you have people there you love you know you can't just leave there's no there's no way for people to move up and out of poverty or up and out of situations not that every, i'm not saying all people are poor i'm just saying or up and out of away from a good job you know where are they going to go if you're you know if you're a mill your paper maker what you're going to just up and leave and go to another paper mill town no, where none sure. of your no i'm just saying i'm just kind of putting these yeah. questions out there it's so complicated so yeah. but i had people ask me that question in grad school like why don't they just leave i was like Oh no, they can't leave, you know, and they don't yeah. want to leave. You know, yeah. they like it. It's like somebody, um, Donna just said, same as Flint, Michigan and water. Blue yeah. Blue people can't and can't afford to leave. And that, that makes sense. But it's, and it, it, you're right. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to get a job? These are one of the few, um, you know, stable job with benefits and, and a future, but but that's those are that's a really high percentage of one family two out of five kids a cancer there's another question here that's related to somebody elizabeth says do the locals defend the mill or are they enraged and um i would say it's neither i i mean i don't think i don't think it's either of those things i think they're just you know okay i spent 10 years on this book researching and going down all these crazy avenues and i barely found answers. And I worked a lot on this book. Who in the world has time to try to follow this, this same line of inquiry if you're working like nine to five and you have four kids or you, you know, or, or you don't have a job and you're trying to feed your kids that are, you know, food insecure as, as, as Jean knows, because Jean is the food um, director in this school district, you know, four to five kids are hungry there. So like, who has time to look at this? I did, I, I did, but, but 10 years of it wasn't even enough to get real answers. So um, are they enraged? I don't think they have time to be enraged. And are they, you know, defend it? No, they're just working, you know, just like kind of everybody. I mean, almost everybody at one point in their life does whatever for money, you mm -hmm. know, you just get do a job. I've done 86 of them myself. <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs> and and being a writer is your eighty seventh, right? My eighty seventh job. Yeah. yeah, that's um, it's it's an interesting way to put it. I wonder how um, you would think that possibly people in Mexico and Rumford and other manufacturing towns might also be um, sort of compromised in a way we now begin to understand with this pandemic that that um, it might feel kind of extra scary for people, especially with respiratory things. And I was just going to say, yeah, they're, they're fine. They're doing research that people from places that have more particulates in the air and are having more cases of COVID. Um, that is really scary. And it, it also makes sense. It's not just particulates, but if you think about those chemical, like the dioxins, for instance, in your body, um, it compromises your immune system a lot. So if you're, you know, if you're really exposed to such things, your immune system's already, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just, I'm just laying out the dots as I see them. <laughs> and it, and it, and I'm seeing news articles that are connecting those dots actually right now with COVID. And, um, and some people aren't, they're like, why is this happening? It's so strange. And I'm like, it doesn't seem strange to me. <laughs> you know, yeah. if your immune system's compromised and, or if you were born, you know, you're breastfed or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it's, so strange. And do you ever feel worried or do you go to the doctor more often than other people or like how do you personally feel about your risk and you know what you I mean I'm surrounded by dangers in a way but um yeah. do you ever yeah um I'll probably get cancer we probably all will it's just when I feel like you know um I'm not gonna, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about stuff like that. And I'd much rather go out in sort of a blaze of glory than dying of cancer. <laughs> it's not a fun way to watch somebody die, you know. Well, don't so funny, I, you know, there's a whole chapter. Stay away from falling trees today. Yeah, there's a chap, you know, in one of the chapters of my father dying and, you know, I read his obituary and he said, oh, he died peacefully with his family by his side, but that wasn't peaceful. It was terrible. Um, and I do want to go back to one thing you said too. The book 
I, it is kind of, there are a lot of funny parts in it. Everywhere. Yeah, there are. There <laughs> because are. you all have this New England sense of humor, whereas like there's a bit of dark, morose humor in everything. Um, you know, you have to be that way. I mean, you have to make yourself laugh. If not, what are we going to do, you know? Yeah, also New Englanders just have that kind of, maybe a lock on that kind of, not New York wise guy, but like wise guy, you know? Yeah, it's <laughs> that like, it's like a little, <laughs> dark, a little, it's, it's, it's not really sarcastic, but it's, yeah, it's kind of like a wise guy. Just a little. Just like he's saying, the, the Patriots, they'll never win, you know, they'll never win. Right, just like. Not the yeah. Patriots now, but you know, the Red Sox for years, like, yeah, they'll never win. Yeah. I'm not sure where that is from. I mean, I think about it a lot, like, but it's definitely, you know, my husband, his family, probably you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, which is so nice to talk to a New England crowd. Yeah. <laughs> you get it. I'm reading some other comments too. Like somebody says like Love Canal in upstate New York. Yes, like Love Canal, except Love Canal, they, it was a big deal and um, they made a big deal about it. Whereas these tiny little towns across the United States, nobody's that's why I said it's a really small and silent sort of things that are happening, but definitely the coal mines in West Virginia and PA, um, Flint, Michigan, again, was massive. So it's like only when it's something on a mass thing will anybody take a look. And that's the idea behind this cancer yearbook too, is if I can just make it so massive that it can't be ignored. Yeah, well, it is a very, you know, sometimes the biggest stories are told in small ways. So you've really, you've done that very well. I think we have time for one last question. Does anyone wanna, does anyone have some pressing, some pressing question? Maybe um, Carrie will divulge her falafel recipe. <laughs> I do love to cook. If anybody, yeah, has email cook. Me, you all have an email. I'll put it again if anybody wants to email me. I'm, is there I'm, anyone with the last question? Because it's a, it, there really is so much going on in this book. Um, here's a, here's a comment actually, which I'll just read. Corporate from Chris Anderson. Corporations that produce these chemicals and know that they are dangerous should be paying for cleaning up the environment, and helping communities that are suffering from the workplaces that use the chemicals. The earth has been poisoned beyond belief. We have to advocate for your planet and be aware of what we purchase. Thank you yeah. for reporting on the situation. So and very just, nice comment from Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Oh. And that, that also speaks to what's happening right now in Louisiana and Texas. I mean, if that hurricane had hit Houston and all those chemical chemicals, we would have had a Chernobyl on our hands. I mean, so. Hey, yeah. uh, Carrie, c congratulations on the book. I, I can't wait to re read it cover to cover. Um, it's so great to, to see what you've done. Um, you know, we lived a lot of the, the same experiences there. Um, obviously, our families are still there. The one thing that's always stuck with me, you know, having come, come from that area, um, you know, remember those are here in Boston, the Boston area, the TV show Chronicle, which is still on the air. They did two episodes uh, on Rumford. The only two that they ever did. And they talked about cancer. It was kind of, you know. It's in the book. The yeah. kind of name that stuck. Yeah. So I haven't I had a chance to read. What were, what were your, your remembrances of that? Or did you, what did, how did you take um, that particular uh, name? Yeah, the Cancer Valley uh, episodes from WCVB, I, I have copies of them. I'd like to get them up on my website somehow if they'd let me. But um, uh, they were not, they, didn't, they weren't shown in the state of Maine as far as I could tell, and I asked them, and they said they weren't. So people in Rumford, New Mexico never saw them. They were Cancer Valley in 1991, and then returned to Cancer Valley in 2001 to follow the, the high rates of, of cancer in our town. It was, it was a pretty good series, but it, it just got really kind of quashed by mill management at the time. I mean. Um, just one quick, Donna asked where you live now, and I can tell people because you're practically my neighbor, but why don't you? Also New England. Right, Donna asked where you live now. Oh, sorry, Mike. Oh, that's okay. My phone just went blank because our, our town, our town <laughs> leaders are calling <laughs> us. To it's completely us. gone dark. Yeah, Donna, Carrie um, lives in Connecticut in kind of the woods south of the Berkshires, Northwest Connecticut, yep. correct? Northwest Connecticut, yeah, about an hour and a half from New York City. I went to grad school there, so we moved here after my husband retired from the Coast Guard. So it's about five hours from Rumford, so. And kind of 
right down Route 7 from Manchester, Vermont. So um, yeah. great shot. You know, we, we I wish I could be there. Yeah, it's such a cozy place in the wintertime, too. I love it there. Anyway, um, I'll let you wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. I wish we could have been in Manchester also, um, or here in Saratoga. It would have been lovely. But thank you all for being here virtually tonight. Thank you so much, Carrie and Marcia, for an absolutely fascinating conversation. I really have enjoyed this, and I think everyone else has as well. Thank you, audience, for being here. Um, we will be back with more Northshire live events uh, throughout the fall. So uh, visit our website, northshire.com, uh, where you can also order Carrie and Marcia's book. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Thank you, evening. Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you Carrie. Okay. This is LJ. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everybody. Had a great time. Great. Hi, Lisa Huber. I see you down there. Lisa, hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> hi, Elizabeth. These are friends of ours here in Roxbury. Yeah. <laughs> and Holly. Hi, Holly. Holly's here, too? Hi, Holly. Yeah. Nice. Terrific. I'm glad everybody got power back, because I still don't have power. Uh-oh. Well, good luck, Carrie. Oh, my husband! Oh, my, husband right. to to my husband's hollering upstairs. <laughs> Hot drama. He's holding a holding a ring from falling on. <laughs> Sorry, it. Rachel. We're keeping you online. We're like, no, no, that's fine. That is fine. At least Lisa says she's in the car. She has Lisa's no power. In the she's car. That is a true friend right there. That is a great. That friend. is dedication. Surprise there. Okay. Um, I am going to hit end if that's okay. Yeah. Good night, yep. everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Nice to see you.